welcome to Close Horse, the podcast that spent a few days this week feeling full of despair, losing all my faith in humanity, thanks to TikTok. I'm your host, Amanda, and this is episode 192. And yes, I really did lose all faith in humanity briefly this week, thanks to TikTok. Man, it is so weird there. Social media is so weird. I'll get into that briefly in a few. Uh, But first, let's talk about this week's episode. My guest is Sandra Ann Miller, who is, well, she is so many things. She's a writer. She's a podcaster on hiatus. And she is a happiness coach. Yeah, you heard me right. Sandra is a happiness coach. And you know, happiness might sound like a very unclosed horse, very un Amanda thing to discuss, but happiness and how difficult it can be to be happy, it's been on my mind a lot lately. You know, I spend so much time thinking about this stuff. And specifically, I've been thinking about how. <sighs> unhappiness or or the difficulty of feeling happy, how that ties into consumerism and life in late stage capitalism, because it's all all so connected. Sandra and I are going to discuss where and how we can find happiness. And you might be surprised about where and how you can find it. We're going to talk about how happiness ties into stuff. I mean, like physical stuff shopping, you know? And we're also going to talk about, because this is on my mind an extra lot lately, how we can find happiness while living in an unjust world. When you spend as much time as I have thinking and talking and writing and recording about fast fashion, overconsumption, its impact on the world, it can be really hard to find happiness, to let yourself feel happiness. And with everything happening in the world right now, as I record this, it's even harder. Sandra and I are going to talk about that and we'll, we'll explore the question. Is it okay to be happy when so much bad stuff is happening in the world around me? Because yeah, I'm sure that's on your mind. It's on my mind all the time. So I'll just go ahead and admit to you, and I don't think any of you are really going to be surprised by this, but you might. I did not watch the Super Bowl. I think I watched the Super Bowl once when I was like 19, maybe 18. It was because I was dating someone who watched it, (laughs) uh, which is also weird to me. Uh, Anyway, last week while the Super Bowl was on, I was actually editing that week's episode of the podcast, so I totally missed it completely, but... Definitely received a lot of messages and emails all about the $21 million worth of Timu commercials that aired during the game. Also, uh, wow, the very accidentally very appropriate slogan, shop like a billionaire that Timu uses is just, just too on point because, you know, You don't get to be a billionaire without exploiting a lot of humans. And Timu, well, it exploits a lot of humans. I mean, they really nailed it there with, I assume, without knowing it. Anyway, I shared a post on TikTok about Timu this week. Honestly, it was something I put together last August when I talked about Timu here on the podcast. I shared it on Instagram back then. Um, and I decided, like, I'm going to share it on, on TikTok because I don't think my followers there have seen it yet. I'd really like to reach more people. In my mind, Timu and Shein and TikTok are so interconnected. Like, this could be a really good opportunity to get people thinking, right? Well, the TikTok algorithm works in a way that I will never understand. And that post went viral, and it's been viewed more than 375,000 times as I record this right now. And it just keeps, just keeps going. Instagram would literally never do that. Instagram would be like, here's 10 people, <laughs> right? But TikTok is like, no, nah, we're going to show it to all these people. Um, I get why people get really addicted to TikTok. I'll tell you that. Because it's really good at just serving you stuff that either upsets you or delights you in a constant series. I guess I'm supposed to feel good 
or a sense of success from that kind of exposure. But honestly, it's been kind of depressing. Like there was one night this week where I was like, I kind of feel like I can't even sleep. Um, I just laid in bed just feeling like weird. I don't know. It was like my body felt like it was like vibrating as if I'd had too much caffeine, but with sadness and rage. And it's because like for every one comment on that post, which there are thousands and thousands of comments on that post, for every comment that was like, thank you, I had a feeling Timu was bad or like, wow, you know, I'm going to tell all my friends or what have you. There were like 20 along the lines of, well, it's not my problem. I like cheap stuff or I'm placing another Timu order right now or just so many people being like, well, listen, it's not my fault that I can only afford Timu and just a lot of people started being like, who cares, right? It's not happening to me. It's happening to someone I don't know. And those are the things that like, those are the conversations I've had to have a lot over the years on Instagram, you know, about fast fashion in general. And I guess I just have been having less of them lately. So I'd sort of forgotten. You know, on top of that, there were a lot of comments denying the Uyghur genocide or trying to lean into whataboutism, like, well, who cares about Timu when there's prison labor? And you're just like, all of these things can exist and be wrong, right? Two wrongs don't make a right. And obviously, like, genocide deniers, not even talking to those people, just block them straight away. There was also one guy who thought I was actually Nike or Amazon trying to turn people away from Timu, which brought a lot of hilarity into the family text chat. It's like, where's our money? Where's our Nike money? Where's our Amazon money? Um, Yeah, it was a lot. And it made me feel, I don't know, anxious, un, extremely pessimistic. <laughs> These are like anxious. Yeah, something I'm feeling all the time, extremely pessimistic, not where I am most days. And so, yeah, it was like, oh, why bother doing anything, right? It was work. It was work to dig myself out of that. It was just so sad to see how little people cared about other humans. And Dylan had warned me a while ago, like, hey, people on TikTok are really feral and like you just have to ignore them. But I was still just so surprised and dismayed and disheartened. And like I said, suddenly feeling so pessimistic. And it made me think a lot about how challenging relationships and empathy are in the social media era, especially three plus years into a pandemic that has isolated us even more. And we've kind of seen social media become more and more anonymous as it has progressed, right? Like some of you might remember the early days of Friendster where you literally had to be like, recommended and invited by your friends. I don't even think you could like meet other friends. I'm not really sure. It was a very short window and I was very young. And then there was MySpace, which got, people got a little bit more trolly, but like you could just go click on someone's profile and know everything about them if they were shitty to you. In Facebook was pretty similar that way. And then Instagram opened the floodgates to creating like private profiles and Finstas and kind of just generally showing up to be shitty to other people without repercussion, right? Like they would never find you. You could say things that you would never say to their face. And TikTok is a part of that. Reddit is even more anonymous. And so as we see our online lives being disconnected from our actual our actual lives, our actual like personal information, uh, it's easier to show up and be a troll, right? And to just say things that you might be embarrassed to say out loud, you know? It's truly a strange time. And while I'm all about leveraging social media to spread information and, you know, build community, I also see how it can undo the spread of true information and the growth and strength of community, right? It's it's tough. It's tough. And this week, I read an interesting piece from The Atlantic by Derek Thompson called Why Americans Suddenly Stopped Hanging Out. And it came out on Valentine's Day. That irony is not lost on me. I'll share this piece in the show notes so you can check it out. It's definitely worth a read. And it's not the longest thing I've ever shared with you all. It's kind of like medium-sized. 
Thompson writes about how until the 1970s, Americans were very social, participating in community groups, churches, book clubs, political associations, sewing circles, social clubs, bowling leagues, the PTA, etc. And in general, both um, adults and kids were spending a lot more time with people outside their families. And this decline continued from the 70s through the following decades. According to Thompson, from 2003 to 2022, American men reduced their average hours of face-to-face socializing by about 30%. That's a third, okay? For unmarried Americans, the decline was even bigger, more than 35%. For teenagers, it was more than 45%. Boys and girls ages 15 to 19 reduced their weekly social hangouts by more than three hours a week. In short, there is no statistical record of any other period in U.S. history when people have spent more time on their own. Now, going back to the teenagers here, that 15 to 19 age group, you know, reducing their social hangouts by more than three hours a week, that might not sound like much, but that's 156 hours in a year. And that's a lot of time that could be spent laughing, making up inside jokes, collaborating, just being around others, which of course has an impact on our mental health. Of course, we tend to think or at least I have definitely thought this, I don't know about you, that social media and texting and emailing and FaceTiming and all these things are a substitute for IRL socialization. Certainly during the early years of the pandemic, we had to settle for that, but then I think we got used to it. And I think we all know that doesn't fully fill the void. And there are almost sort of levels, right? Like social media interaction would maybe be the least socially and emotionally fulfilling, where it's like maybe Zoom hangouts, Twitch stuff, or phone calls and FaceTiming, they would be much more profound, right? There's a whole spectrum here, though. And I think for the most part, we have tended to shift more and more away from those more, I don't know, like intense situations, even like phone calls and Zooms, and more heavily into social media and texting because we're busy, right? Because No one wants to talk on the phone or do FaceTime and Zoom is frustrating. And so we just opt for these other sort of more distant forms of interaction. There's something about the IRL energy, like what it feels like to be around other people, physically be around them in your space. And there's also discomfort associated with that too, to varying degrees, depending who we are. But there's something about that energy and even that discomfort that is good for our brains. And it helps us understand other people and build empathy and connections. It's it's something you can't replace. I'll tell you, the happiest time in my entire life, that was the years I spent living in LA. I did fun stuff with my friends every weekend, whether it was like going to the beach, going hiking, just hanging out. Uh taking road trips to different parts of California, eating food, laughing. It was just incredible. I spent a lot of time laughing with my coworkers or going to happy hour with them and talking more. I had friends that I met at bar class every night. And in general, I just spent a lot of time with other people. Like the most I had spent with other people probably since like college. When Dustin and I moved to Portland after LA, I still saw people, but it was markedly less. And my job was kind of lonely. I worked all the time. Dustin worked at night most times. Back then, he was still doing live sound and touring. So most nights after work, I sat on the couch with the cats or I went for a walk alone. And it was it was an adjustment. Like I almost sometimes would dread the weekends because I would be like, oh, more time alone. You know, I felt a little depressed which was interesting to me because I am kind of a solitary person by nature, or at least I'm introverted and I'm good at being alone. You know, I didn't grow up with a lot of other kids um, and I got really good at entertaining myself. I have to ask you, like, did your parents have friends when you were growing up? Because I, I hear about this, that people's parents had friends, 
But my mom really did not. She worked, she came home, she watched TV, she spent time with my grandma and uncles about once a week, but she didn't have friends, really, like that she hung out with or talked on the phone with. And she definitely stood in the way of my building friendships, couldn't even understand why I would want to do that in the first place. I'm sure that was all a larger part of her own, like the psychological abuse. That's a whole other podcast there. But, you know, I wasn't allowed to go to sleepovers or parties, and I was pretty heavily parentified by mid-elementary school. So I was like spending my evenings, weekends, and summers babysitting my brother and doing housework. I was often not allowed to participate in social stuff because there would be no one to do those jobs if I wasn't home. So I spent a lot of time alone, making stuff, reading, doing chores, of course, And it wasn't uncomfortable to me because I was used to it. That doesn't mean that I didn't have a longing for it. And maybe even also sort of a fear of it, right? Because I just was so outside of it. And I was aware that other kids were hanging out with each other a lot and having fun and laughing about things and talking about it at school. And I did feel jealous for sure. And I felt left out. But I also was comfortable being alone. It was wild to move into my adult life and make real long-lasting friends who over time became my family more than my actual blood relatives were. And I would think sometimes about how strange it was that my life was so different from my mom's. It wasn't just the friends all over the world that I made over time as I moved from place to place and different jobs, did different things. It was also the volunteer work that I did and the exercise classes and the creative collaborations. These were not things that I saw modeled for me by the adults in my life. Like my grandma had a lot of friends. Everywhere we'd go, she'd run into someone she knew, and sometimes we'd go visit friends or go meet them for breakfast. And so my grandma was very social. But she was sort of the outlier because no one else was. And they sort of judged her for being so social. I appreciated it, of course. I I would say as I reached adulthood, I was like, oh, I'm a lot more like my grandma. Like my friends are important to me. By the time Dustin and I arrived in Philadelphia two years before the pandemic, all of that stuff that I'd done for so long, the exercise classes, the volunteer work, the, the weekends with my friends, the creative projects, they were they were drying up. They, In fact, they just kind of dried up completely when we got there. All I did was work and hang out with Dustin and Dylan, and that was fine, but I felt, I felt lonely. Now that we've made that move to Lancaster after Austin, I'm committed to changing that because I can see that while I have a lot of social anxiety and I think years of isolation has made it worse, being around people is good for me. It's good for my brain. It's good for my heart. A few weeks ago, we joined the co-working space here in town. It's called the Candy Factory. It really is, as far as I can tell, in an old candy factory. And it has already felt like a good thing for me just to make jokes with others and laugh and be around other people and hear their conversations after years of mostly not hearing anything other than podcasts or NPR. And, you know, Friday they had a happy hour, which they do every Friday. And normally these are the kind of things I try to avoid. I have a lot of anxiety about it. So does Dustin. But I was like, we're going to stay. They're doing pirate trivia. I literally don't know anything about pirates. I don't care about pirates. Trivia gives me anxiety. I stayed. I had so much fun. When we left, I felt like I was like high on life, like just so giddy. And like I I went to bed that night feeling good in a way I hadn't in a long time, right? Nothing big happened that day. I just hung out with other people. There's something important to be said here for the greater social impact of this decline in social activity. I think it fuels trollishness, apathy, and unhappiness. In his essay, Thompson writes, I do think every social crisis in the U.S. could be helped somewhat if people spent a little more time with other people and a little less time gazing into digital content that's designed to make us anxious and despondent about the world. 
This young century, Americans have collectively submitted to a national experiment to deprive ourselves of camaraderie in the world of flesh and steel, choosing instead to grow and grow and grow the time we spend by ourselves, gazing into screens, wherein actors and influencers often engage in the very acts of physical proximity that we deny ourselves. It's been a weird experiment. And the results haven't been pretty. And man, I do feel that. Why did people stop hanging out? I mean, I can only speculate on the reasons, but I don't think any of them will surprise you. You know, for one, there aren't as many sort of like third places to hang out, meaning places that are neither school slash work nor our homes. The mall is kind of dead. Definitely a place where I hung out as a teenager. A lot of people feel unsafe in parks, and every other place costs money. So where do you go to hang out with people? There are also a lot less sort of like social clubs. Like, do you know anyone in our age group who is a member of the Elks Lodge? You know what I mean? Or the VFW or all these other places where people would go to hang out. You know, my grandparents, I'll tell you, they belong to so many of these social organizations, whether There was like a private club called the Hawks Gun Club, but it was really just where people went to hang out. They had a great Easter egg hunt every year. My grandparents also belonged to the Elks Lodge, and that was another place where they would go do social activities and meet up with their friends. Um, Of course, there were all kinds of groups that were more community action focused, like the JCs. They're still going, but like I don't know millennials that belong to those groups. I certainly don't know any Gen Zers. And I wonder what will happen to those larger social groups as boomers, you know, get older and older. We just don't have places or reasons to get together in the same way. What else? People are working and they are working a lot. How many people do you know who only have one job. Everybody I know is like a blank slash blank slash blank. We all have like two, three, four jobs. We're hustling all the time. I feel like the list of people I know with one job is pretty short for me at this point. And those people with only one job are working all the time, answering texts and emails after hours and on weekends. And for me in the past, I felt like It was too much to try to socialize while knowing that I'd end up having to deal with work stuff in the midst of that. Like it really, it really turned me off of it and just made me isolate myself more. And also life in the digital age eats up a lot of time and emotional energy with a constant flow of notifications, new posts, messages, and so much more. There isn't time or energy left to go out and see people IRL. To me, it's no coincidence that politics have gotten even more divisive and conspiracy theories more extreme, and the world is kind of generally much scarier because we don't know one another anymore. And if you don't think in the midst of this loneliness, see also last week's episode, if you don't think in the midst of this loneliness that we aren't spending more time scrolling and shopping, well... I know you know that we are. It doesn't help that social media platforms, literally all of them at this point, have integrated ads and shopping seamlessly into what is supposed to be a social experience for us. Such a weird time. And I got to tell you, like I said in last week's episode, if you haven't listened to that, go check it out. Community is really the way forward. Like this is where we're going to make change happen, which means we have to connect with one another and build relationships. And I believe that there are many different ways that we can do that, both virtually and IRL. But definitely those in real life interactions are an important part of this. So here's what I want to hear from all of you. What are you doing to connect with others? and to build community. Where are your third spaces? The answer is gonna be different for everyone, and I wanna hear about them. And I wanna know, how do you think we can build a bigger, stronger, slow fashion community? Share all the ideas with me, because this is a focus for me this year. It's something I'm thinking about constantly. I'm gonna be continuing to think about and expanding upon it. So I wanna hear what you're thinking. You can send me a voice memo recorded on your phone. 
You can send that via email, or you can actually write out what you're thinking in an email. Um, you can send that to me at amanda at closehorse.world. Please, no Instagram DMs. I also have sad news. Uh, it feels like the end of an era, and that is that the Close Horse hotline is officially RIP. Google took it away because we weren't using it. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. Maybe someday we'll figure out a backup new hotline number, but that's sad. I had so many, it makes me think of the first year of Close Horse. We used it so much, um, but then we got hip to voice memos. <laughs> anyway, I'm keeping the intro short this week because my conversation with, with Sandra is quite long. So let's jump right in. All right, why don't you introduce yourself to everyone? Hello, I'm Sandra Ann Miller, and I am uh, reluctantly a happiness coach, <laughs> but thrilled to be one at the same time. <laughs> yeah, you know, when I first got your email and I was like one sentence in, I was like, a uh, happiness coach, no, delete, spam folder, whatever, <laughs> but I kept reading. So why don't you tell everyone... <laughs> How you became a happiness coach. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, I it's the term that I have the issue with, not the actual work. So I'm I'm working through that. But I had been in a pretty bad mood since about 2016. Yep. And yeah. And I sat myself down at the end of 2022 and said, girl, we can't keep going on like this. Like we need to do something. And it's not like I was walking around growling or anything, <laughs> but I just wasn't happy. I just wasn't feeling good about enough stuff. And it's not like I didn't go out with friends and laugh and have a good time, but they're just inside. It just wasn't great. And so I did some research, like what should I do? And, you know, I've been to therapy and all that. And and that's great. But it, it was something that I knew I needed to do and I needed to shift something. And I stumbled upon, of all things, happiness coaching. And weirdly, it clicked with me. It's like, yes, this. And let me just preface this. Like I went to film school. <laughs> I, I write like this isn't something that, you know, was on my radar. But once I started looking into it, I'm like, yes, this is sort of what I think a lot of us are missing is just having the permission to be happy, mm -hmm. especially with the world being the world and our lives not being perfect. We keep waiting for something to change in order for us to be happy. And um, that's not really working, is it? Yeah. I mean, happiness has always felt so elusive. Right. But then I take right. a step back and I'm like, actually, like, that was a pretty happy time or that day was mm -hmm. really happy or I felt great. And I think we, well, you know, I'll just say when you and I were preparing for this episode, you said something that really stuck with me that I've been reflecting upon, which is you said, I think we've gotten screwed up about what happiness is. Yes. And I think we tend to think it has, every happy moment has to be like the equivalent of, you know, like a, a Sunday buffet, and I mean like ice cream Sunday <laughs> buffet right. at Disneyland on your birthday, you know, <laughs> like and everything's free, right? And everything's free, right? And everybody is required to give you like five compliments during the day, right? Like we we have it built up that like certain moments of our life are intended to be the most important and meaningful and happy days of our lives. We hear these things about like oh. Your teenage years are the best years of your life. I'm sure you've heard that. You heard that a million mm -hmm. times when you were a teenager. And I was like, I really hope that that is not true because the rest of life is going to be real bad if this is the as good as it gets, you know. But we hear these things that kind of build up this idea about what happiness is. Right. And we're kind of taught that it's outside of us. Like we need to – achieve certain things. Our lives have to be a certain way. You know, it's, it's a lot of it is status. We have to get that job and earn that money and buy that house and drive that car and go to these places and be seen in these shoes and carry this purse or whatever it is. And that isn't working for anybody as far as I can tell. And 
what I don't think we know or what I didn't know is that there are two types of happiness. There's hedonic and there's eudaimonic. And hedonic, you know, hedonism, it's everything that's kind of outside of us. It's people, places, and material things. It's experiences. It's what we are taught to go forward and grasp for. And the problem with hedonic happiness is because it's outside of us, it doesn't last very long. And Mm -hmm. when it goes away, it's really deflating and depressing. And we wonder what we did wrong. And now we have to go after more and more, and it has to be bigger and bigger. And that happiness hits us and then it goes away again. Whereas Mm -hmm. with eudaimonic happiness, and that's like a spelling bee word, it's E-U-D-A-I-M-O-N-I-C. And that's the happiness that comes from within. That's the true stuff. That's the real deal. And that's that comes from having a sense of appreciation for who you already are and what you already have. It's Mm -hmm. understanding your worth and it's understanding your sense of purpose. And those are all things that we aren't really taught to do or feel good about because if we have a strong sense of self-worth, well, then we must be really, you know, in love with ourselves, conceited, arrogant, or whatever. And if we have <laughs> <True>. this, <laughs> right? It is discouraged to feel good about yourself. Yes. Yeah. And to have a sense of purpose, well, that's also sort of arrogant, like I'm going to go forth mm-hmm. and conquer or whatever, but it's not. And and so we are almost in all ways taught to be unhappy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's true. It's true because I think there also is like sort of a, I don't know, like a jealousy component to happiness, mm-hmm. not like your own happiness, but like seeing other people being happy or confident or having a sense of purpose depending on the moment you encounter that, you just, you feel angry, right? That's what like the the jealousy yeah. is where you're like, why isn't that me? Why don't I have that sense of purpose? Why don't I feel that good about myself? Um, I think social the social media era definitely like exacerbates that for a lot of us because we're only seeing the highlights real. We're not mm-hmm. seeing people's true like internal experience. And we're seeing but... everything through a filter. Exactly, exactly. And so I think, I don't know, that kind of one, it like ups the stakes for what happiness is. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, it makes us more unhappy because we are experiencing our own resentment of other people's happiness. (laughs) It's really hard to be happy right now. It is. And it's, and a lot of it is, you know, one, like I said, you know, we feel like we have to earn it or deserve it. And then Mm -hmm. we look outside at the world. Well, how dare I be happy? with this going on and with that going on and these things happening. And believe me, it's, it's not that I'm not aware and it's not that I'm not upset and angry and doing what I can about it, but it's not one or the other. And that's, that's the thing. You can be happy and extremely pissed off and you can be happy and so sad about what's happening. It's not a one or the other. It's, it's walking and chewing gum. Yeah, yeah. You know, you're making me think of a book I read as a kid. And I can't remember the name of it. It might have been a Lois Lowry book, but I might have the wrong writer. And I'm going to have to look it up and put it in the show notes for everyone later. But basically, it takes place during World War II. And this girl and her family are in hiding, right, because they are Jewish. And Mm -hmm. one day while she is at school, her entire family is taken and sent off to the concentration camps. And she's left alone and a family hides her, you know, away in their school. And the teacher, one of the teachers there will often come to her and chastise her for laughing or being happy because she should never feel joy again as long as she's lost her family. Like That's what this person says to her. And... That really stuck with me, uh, has stuck with me through my adulthood. And I think back to, you know, when I was in my 20s, my partner passed away while I was Mm. pregnant with our child. So it was a very, very bad time. Yes. And there would be moments during all that grief where I would laugh or feel like, wow, that was a nice day. Mm -hmm. And I would have this moment of guilt of I – 
shouldn't be feeling happy right now. I am going through the one of the worst times of my life. And then I would remind myself of how how ridiculous that was, that like mm-hmm. life is layered and life is also short. And sometimes things are going very wrong within your life or outside of your life in the larger world. And that doesn't mean that there aren't moments where you laugh or, or are happy. Right. You can have both. And we're learning not to live in the binary, right? Yeah. So yeah. what we need to kind of open that up emotionally as well. So being happy isn't taking away from any other circumstance. And it's also not like dancing through the daisies, completely oblivious to what's going on. <laughs> that's not happiness. Right. That's toxic positivity. And that yep. is the antithesis of happiness. In order to be truly happy, you have to feel all of your feelings. You have to really embrace all of your emotions because one, we are in control of them, believe it or not. So you don't have to let them run amok if you don't want to. Mm -hmm. And two, they're there to teach us. There's some sort of lesson that that anger or that disappointment or that upset or that sadness or that frustration is trying to teach us. And we just aren't taught to pay attention to that and kind of ask the question, like, why did I react that way? Why am I feeling that way? Was it that big of a deal? Or, you know, was it an overreaction? And just get to learn about ourselves in that way. We're, I don't think we're ever really taught that. We're just taught to not do something. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. So how do you recommend that we cultivate like that right kind of happiness within our lives? Because, you know, obviously Close Horse is a podcast about overconsumption and mm-hmm. shopping and the fashion industry. And I, I mean, I think we can all agree that there is such a massive link between our pursuit of happiness and our shopping habits and mm-hmm. our overconsumption, right? So how do we cultivate the right kind of happiness that doesn't necessarily involve buying shit (laughs) (laughs) to be blunt we all know that that happiness lasts until you get your credit card bill right (laughs) or if if you're lucky i mean it's like you get the package and you take the stuff out of the box and you're like oh yeah (laughs) now now i'm sad or now i tried it on and i'm like what's wrong with my body or whatever because it was so crappily made so Mm -hmm. that happiness is very fleeting right Well, we're taught, I mean, we live in a capitalist society and we're taught to be Mm -hmm. very good consumers Mm -hmm. and we're taught again to reach outside of ourselves. And I forget, was it the eighties where retail therapy became a thing? Oh, I don't know. It just keeps coming back. (laughs) Right. And all the, think about all the movies we watched growing up that were like the shopping montage, Mm -hmm. like, especially if it's like a teen movie, that's the real turning point between the nerd being miserable and alone and then being popular and in demand, you know, like happy. It's like, oh, it's the shopping trip. That's, that's the real turning point in the plot of this film. Well, and it's, you know, it, there is a hole we feel, right? There's a gap that we feel Mm -hmm. inside of us. And we don't know what that is, but we want to fill it up. And so we reach for things that are outside of us. And believe me, I've, I've been there where it's like, I, you know, these pants are going to change my life. Those shoes are going to change my life. I need that purse. Right. (laughs) Right. Right. But, you know, but we think that there's some sort of solution outside of us, but to create eudaimonic happiness, the real deal, it's really simple. It's just shifting your perspective and learning to appreciate things. And appreciation is my preferred term because gratitude has sort of been co-opted by toxic positivity. And it also gives you a lot of homework. You're supposed to be feeling it all the time. You're supposed to be journaling about it. No. Appreciation is, you know, it is gratitude. It is being thankful but when we look at the word itself, it's kind of mathy. When something appreciate, it it grows in value, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So I kind of, I'm a wordy chick, so I, I kind of like that word a lot. So having appreciation for the smaller things, as well as the big things, it helps you to kind of be aware of what's bringing you joy. So for me, 
It's hawks and hummingbirds and green lights and parking spaces that are good. And especially if they're free, those mm-hmm. will make me extraordinarily happy. And we can argue that those are outside of me, of course, but it's the appreciation I feel that mm-hmm. lingers and brings me joy and makes me smile. So if you can focus on, you know, if it's a really good cup of coffee, then hey, appreciate it. That's wonderful. And if it's getting to work on time when you thought you were going to be late, appreciate that. I say thank you all the time to everything. You know, (laughs) the food (laughs) delivery gets there earlier than I thought. Thank you. The green light stays longer than it should. Thank you. It's, it's a silly practice, but it really helps me to stay in that place of appreciation where things are good. Even when I'm having a bad day, there are good things happening. Thank you for that. And then it's also really getting to like ourselves, if not actually love ourselves. And again, without conceit, it's just, how can we not like ourselves or love ourselves? We are with ourselves all day, every day. Mm -hmm. So we should have a good friendship with ourselves. And that takes time and that takes understanding. And a lot of the way we feel about ourselves was kind of pushed upon us by other people or society or, you know, parents. So we have to (laughs) kind of get to, yes. (laughs) So we have to kind of get to know ourselves and really pay attention to how we do things and how we move in the world and what our talents are and what we're really good at. And whether that's just how we show up for our friends or the fact that we are kind enough to hold open the door for somebody. It's just paying attention to those things and creating that sense of worth. And then, of course, having a purpose. And that might be right now being a parent or being a spouse or being a caregiver or going back to school or just trying to be the best human you can be. It doesn't have to be, I'm going to save the world, or I'm going to create this app, or I'm going to do this thing. It's just what's driving you now, what's making you feel the most you right now. And so those are the ways that we start planting those seeds of real happiness. And then, of course, the hedonic is going to come, and those mm-hmm. are delightful. But it, it, when that high goes away, you don't have that crashing low anymore because your foundation of happiness is pretty solid. You understand it better and you're not looking for it to come to you. You're creating it yourself by appreciating that cup of coffee, by, you know, that thing you need, dish soap or whatever, it's on sale. Oh, thank you. That's great. I'm saving like a buck. whoop you do It's, it's just looking around for the good stuff and it is there. But again, it's not in a toxic positivity way. You're not BSing yourself about it. You have to really understand your joys, what makes you feel good. For me, like the perfect French fry is heaven. And that brings me a phenomenal amount of joy. So it's it's just really appreciating who's around you, what's around you, and embracing that. Yeah. You know, as you talk about that, I'm thinking about how often, and I think this is like the kind of stuff, you know, You'll hear from like self-help articles in women's magazines. And well, I suppose that most of them are RIP now. So let's say blog posts or social media uh, content. It's always like, oh, are you unhappy? Well, to get happy, you have to make these extreme life changes and then you will be happy. So, you know, you will quit your job and get a new job or you'll go back to school or you'll open your own business or you'll, you know, it's just, it's always these huge things, right? Right. And it's all all costing money. (laughs) It all costs money for sure. And it's all just like out of reach for a lot of people to be like, I'm just going to quit my job because it makes me unhappy is not an option for most people, right? Right. Like they, it's like a whole process or moving to a new place or, you know, all of these other things. And it's often just sold to us as this like big thing we have to do. That's, that's the reason happiness is elusive for us. And I, 
I had this one year where I just was like, I am so unhappy. And believe it or not, it was before 2016, which is saying a lot because 2016 <laughs> was definitely a turning point in my life too. But uh, I was just like, everything about my life sucks. I like don't really like my job. It's okay, but it's like not great. And I keep getting into these really unhappy dating situations. Uh, I feel really lonely. I feel like everything I do is just like so hard. And it's really hard for me to feel find happiness. And so Mm -hmm. rather than saying, you know what I'm going to do is I'm going to quit my job. I'm going to move to another city. I'm going to start my life over. I'm going to join a gym. I'm going to get a personal trainer, like all the big things that people will say are like, this is what you have to do. I said, okay, my new year's resolution is that every month this year, I'm going to add two things to my life, like a way of doing things that makes me happy and is like brings sustainable long-term happiness and quality of life improvement. So Mm -hmm. I got a library card so that I could read more books and save money while I was doing it. That was great, right? Because the side benefit is that I would also walk from work to the library and I'd get to like see birds and people and squirrels and just feel feel good while I was doing it, right? I Mm -hmm. signed up for a produce box so I could cook more food at home, which cooking is like such a a source of joy for me. And then I could also eat a nice lunch every day. That was my leftovers, right? Like just a little thing that was like, ah, right. Um, You know, joining a car share service because I didn't have a car. And sometimes I just, I just wanted to not carry my groceries home or go to the beach or something like just these little things. And Mm -hmm. one, I carried so many of those changes on for years and years, even until now. And two, I was happier. Yeah. Like almost immediately. (laughs) (laughs) it was wild you know I didn't have to like reboot my life at all right because it's yes you can do those things and let me tell you I have left and the net has not appeared yep 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 and so I refer to that as malignant optimism like we're taught to like if you want to manifest something you've got to believe and you've got to dig in and you know stay the course and all that no I basically destroyed my life because I have been on the floor in a heap weeping with a three-day notice on my door with no money in my bank my cable and internet turned off you know the the special color that the DWP and the gas company would send before they're going to turn you off. Oh, I know Um, this one. Yeah. yeah. (laughs) (laughs) And, and so like, you know, if somebody came to me and said, just appreciate what you have, I'm not a violent person, but I probably would have taken a swing. You know what I mean? And so I'm, I understand like being in that depth and I love how you decided, like, I'm going to make myself happy. And I'm going to do these things that bring me joy. And they didn't really cost a whole lot, did they? No, no. And they weren't, they weren't these big, scary changes, which when I would talk to my friends about my unhappiness, I never even said the word unhappy, but like it was, it was apparent. Their, their suggestions would be those huge leaps. Like you should move to, you should move to LA or you should, (laughs) you should like, totally quit your job and just like take six months off and I was like what who's gonna pay my bills like right. these are these are first off I I'm gonna tell you as a person who's moved all around the country many times moving does not equal instant happiness <laughs> you know uh quitting your job uh, getting a new job even it can it can lead to a higher quality of life it can also lead to a nightmare okay right <laughs> and I think that it's just like Often the options we're given for finding happiness are either buy something or take this huge change, make it right mm-hmm. away, and then the happiness will be there. And, you know, listen, I've had that kind of optimism about a change in the past. Like I eventually actually after that year of of making myself more happy, I did move to L.A. I did get a new job. And that was a great move for me. But not right out of the gate. I was like, moving is so stressful. I'm so lonely. I keep getting lost. Like everything in LA is harder, you know? And like, I would have to like, you know, I'd be like walking to the subway in the morning. I'd be like, hey, here are reasons to be happy. It's February and it's like 75 degrees and sunny. (laughs) 
<laughs> right? There's like parrots that live in my neighborhood and there are palm trees, which are really cool because I'm from Pennsylvania where they don't grow. And, you know, I would have to see these beautiful things and I would feel really, really happy. But the moving wasn't the, the reason, you know? Mm-hmm. And I just think we, the narratives for pursuit of happiness, it's like we're told don't be too happy, but also – Make do things to make yourself happy, but only these like really specific things. It's like right hard to win. <laughs> it really is, and it's and it's you know it's like it's also it's your fault, right? It's your fault you're not happy. Yeah, yeah, definitely. It always is, right? And it's like a change you're supposed to make immediately to address. But we're not taught to be happy. No, definitely not. Right, we're not taught to foster the things that will bring us joy. It's like. Don't don't pay attention to that. That's too small. Go for the bigger stuff. And the bigger stuff is just draining. And it's only going to fix a little bit. And that happiness really isn't going to stick if you're not already happy in you. So if you had moved to LA before you had set yourself up for good stuff, how bad would that have been? I would have been terrible. I would have been yes. like, you know what I need to do is get a boyfriend. Now I'll be happy. Because that's another thing. It's always like you sh- – I remember actually about a month bef- or two before I moved to LA, uh, a friend who was like not my friend now I realized was like not a friend was mm-hmm. – we were out and she was just like, you know, you know what your problem is is that she was like, first off, you're not going to get that job in LA because if you were, you would have it already. So you need to give up on that. And secondly, your problem is you have too high of standards for people you date. And if you would just like ex- not look for someone who is like super handsome or super <sighs> successful or super interesting and just be happy that they like liked you, then you would be happy. And I was like, what? Wow. You're saying I should just like – compromise what I want in order to be happy. Like, I was like, that is really bad friend advice. Um, You know, it was sort of just like, give up and then you will be happy. I'm sure that was coming from different, uh, something within her for sure. Definitely. But I do think like, it, it is hard to find happiness sometimes because we're looking in the wrong places. But mm-hmm. I also think like, we're really quick to look for what's bad and it's like we can't give ourselves I think it's stigmatized to be to feel happiness sometimes and I think especially if you are like a smart or funny or politically or environmentally minded person like if you care Mm -hmm. about things you care about people uh being happy is almost like anachronistic to being that person like you're not supposed Mm -hmm. to be right and you and I were talking about this before how the different generations that exist right now on our world right now they their approach to happiness was it was and is sort of different like I'm not really sure I I guess like when it comes to like boomer happiness it's probably really rooted in consumption is my guess Mm mm-hmm well, and also, how dare you be happy? Don't you see what's going on in the world? And you didn't work hard enough for it or anything like that. You know what I mean? It's like, it was all about work, work, work. Yeah, it's true. It's true. And like, you know, the 80s were like the me decade because boomers mm-hmm. were like young adults then. And they were like, it's all about me and my career success and what I can buy and like really conspicuous consumption, mm-hmm. right? And then Gen X, which, you know, you said, you know, you're Gen X. I'm on that cusp of Gen X and millennial. Definitely identify more millennial because the Gen X people always thought I was too young and uncool, (laughs) which was probably true. Um, Gen X was like, it's not cool to be happy, right? Like, if you're happy, I don't know. I immediately think of, like, Ethan Hawke in Reality Bites when I even say that out loud. Not that he said that, but that was his energy. Like, if you're happy, then you're not paying attention to the world. Exactly. And then millennials, we go we, – the pendulum swings back to like if you just buy the right stuff, you'll be happy. But most importantly, you're going to show that happiness on social media. Mm-hmm. So like avocado toast and travel and clothes <laughs> and Coachella and 
all all of that. Like I remember specifically when like social media was like really happening, like Instagram specifically, like let's say 2015-ish, 2014, being like, why is everyone on earth happier than me? <laughs> like I just was like <laughs> – I don't go on big trips. I haven't had a, some picturesque destination wedding. I never eat avocado toast. I don't even really like it that much. Like, I don't have a perfectly curated breakfast at home every day. I am not a foodie out there taking pictures of my meals. You know, I just felt like I was being shown there were these different kinds of happiness you could have, and none of them – were were in reach for me or maybe even of interest to me. Well, and none of them are real. None of them are real, but it takes you a while to figure that out, right? You're like, wait sure. a minute. You know, I think for me, it was like there was this one couple who seemed to have the most perfect relationship ever based on Instagram. And I hung out with them once for a whole weekend with other people. It wasn't like a weird threesome or anything. And, <laughs> you know, like just no, don't want to start any rumors there. But we were all hanging what? out and I was like, oh my God, that couple is like really unhappy. Like they – are disrespectful to one another. They seem to have no interest in what the other person thinks about or says or they're, they're, they share no common interests. Um, and I was like, wow, like, wait, you're telling me that not everything on social media is real? Like that was the, <laughs> you know, I was like 30 years old or something and I was like, wow, well, you just got me, <laughs> you know, <laughs> like I'm so shocked. <laughs> um, and I like wonder like, I, I Gen Z, I think, in, to a certain extent, has like, and I really hate generalizing by generations, but the reality right. is that there are patterns here. It seems like Gen Z, they're in a unique place, which I do not envy, which is on one hand, hey, guess what? The world is so fucked. And on the other hand, like, well, whatever, I'm going to get my own happiness. Like, mm -hmm. I, I, I don't know. Like, I, I feel like we all need like a happiness overhaul. We do. We really do. And I'm going to be a little dark here for a second. To me, the reason why I'm such an advocate for being happy right now, as is, is because happy people aren't the ones dropping bombs. Happy True. people aren't the ones picking up guns and ruining lives. Happy people are not the ones trying to take away rights and opportunities from other people. And happy people are not the ones not baking cakes. We it's have had enough unhappiness for so long. And when we look at our landscape and we talk about, you know, cultish behaviors and people being in a cult, whatever kind of cult we can, you know, conjure up. It's because people are feeling lonely and afraid and feeling invisible. So they reach out, again, reaching outside for something that makes them feel connected. If we start realizing that, hey, the most important relationship I'm going to have is with me. And again, that sounds very selfish, very conceited, and, but it's not. It's the same thing as putting your mask on first. Mm -hmm. You have to do it because if you're not taking care of yourself, you're not really going to do a good job of taking care of other people. If you're not very healthy with yourself, then eventually all that care and love and stuff that you give to other people, you're just going to burn out and be even unhappier. So it's, it's that we're at a crucial time in this world. And I mean, I could have never imagined where we would be when I was really happy in the nineties, you know, things seemed pretty good. <laughs> mm -hmm. The worst thing that happened involved a cigar and, you know, I mean, definitely there was war and, you know, there's the Gulf war and stuff. And it's really easy to kind of not remember that because it was so far removed from us, right? Mm -hmm. Our gas prices went up. That was, and you know, if you didn't know anybody in the military, then you really didn't know what was going on, right? So again, that's mm -hmm. perspective. We don't know what we don't know. And it's really easy to remember just the good parts that we were experiencing. But getting to today, never in my wildest dreams could I have, you know, 
Margaret Atwooded this scenario, right? <laughs> yeah, I know. I mean, this century, I think about this a lot. Like, were was it a simpler time in the 80s and 90s, or am I fictionalizing it, like, you know, because right now is so nightmarish? I don't think so. I think it is really fucking grim right now. Yeah, I will say it was really e easy in the 80s and 90s because we didn't have social media. We didn't have cell phones. You might have had a beeper. And then towards the end of the 90s, you might have had a really big brick of a cell phone. So mm -hmm. things were easier. Life moved slower, even though then we thought, you know, we were on like the cusp of everything, you know, technological and we we're just living in the future, right? Mm -hmm. But it, it was a simpler time. All of these things that keep us connected also complicate things and they overwhelm us. And, you know, now there are a bunch of people that are getting rid of their smartphones and going back to a flip phone just to get away from the overwhelm. And, um, yeah, were we happier then? I don't know. I mean, I was a kid, so yeah, probably, but as a society, well, that's when we started with, you know, the power suit and, you know, greed is good, right? That line mm -hmm, from mm -hmm. Wall Street. Yeah. So all of the materialism really started coming into play then. And the 90s had a little bit of pushback with it with grunge, but not a whole lot. We had like an awareness of the environment and things we should do. And MTV would give PSAs about not using paper towels, right? Yeah. But we are where we are. So we can't look back. And I know that, especially now, we think the pandemic's over. It's really not. But um, we keep wanting to go back to a normal. But that doesn't exist anymore. We have to create our reality in the way that we want it to be. We can't keep looking back to what was. We have to deal with what's going on right now and work to create something we can live in be proud of, be comfortable in. And that's understanding we only have so much control over our lives and this world, but we do have a say in how we feel and we can really work to build that happy muscle just like you did. It's, it can be as simple as a library card. It can be as simple as a walk through the park. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It doesn't mm -hmm. have to be these big things. It doesn't have to be you know, a complete shift. It just really starts simple. And, and that's what we need to kind of start embracing because we can't keep going on in this misery. In my opinion, I, it's not working to me. It's clearly not working and we need to do something. And to me, that something is being happier within ourselves because from there we'll start making better choices for ourselves, for our community, and hopefully for the world. Yeah, I, I agree with that. You know, it's funny, like, thinking about how we sort of have to accept the change, right, mm -hmm. is really, really important. There was this subreddit a couple years ago. It's gone now. Reddit had to get rid of it because it was so, like, toxic. And it was called oh. No New Normal. And it was basically – I think it started as, like, people who didn't want to wear masks or right. social distance, right, and who wanted to be able to eat in restaurants. I literally – remember seeing a post on there that was like, I can't believe I can't even have a date night at a restaurant. It's like, well, if you really want a date night, there's like a million other things you could do that don't involve a restaurant. Right. So maybe you're just really boring. That's a whole other conversation. But <laughs> it it evolved into like, why are women having jobs? And, you know, mm -hmm. why do women get to like pick who they marry? And <laughs> why racism isn't real? Like, what, you know, like things, it was just, it was, I was like, wow, like, I don't even know what normal y'all are trying to get back to. And you don't want this new normal where like the world is better. Like maybe you were, I don't know, you're like thinking of like the 1950s from the uh, perspective of like a cis white male. Like, I'm not really sure, mm -hmm. but. We're never going back there. And if you're sitting around, I mean, imagine the amount of energy one would spend being upset every day about how women have jobs. <laughs> like, imagine the toll that would take on you physically and emotionally to be sitting around all day being angry about how women have jobs. 
or are allowed to vote or that people wear masks. <laughs> like, right. Just thinking about how miserable you would be all the time because you just cannot accept that like the world has changed. And but even that, just, yeah. no, it's yeah. crazy, but even that it's looking outside yourself and yeah. pointing the finger at like, I don't like how you do this and I don't like how that's being done and I don't want this anymore. And it's like, okay, but where is that coming from? What part of you is broken in that way that you need to hate other people yeah. and purposely using that term because there is no dislike anymore. It's just, it's gone to that oh, level. Yeah. It's very, it's very extreme. And yeah, like I think about that, like how exhausting that must ah. be, just how exhausting it must be. I mean, we all have those moments where we're laying in bed at night, like maybe we are having trouble sleeping or we woke up from a bad dream and we're laying in bed and we start thinking about some job we had or some coworker we had or someone we dated like 10 years ago who treated us poorly and you're starting, you can feel yourself getting angry, right? Mm -hmm. And just like, I have, I assume for people who are just like so full of hate that this is like every moment of their lives, they feel that anger. And I hate that feeling when I'm laying in bed rehashing something someone said to me at work five years ago, you know, right. like I can't imagine having it all the time. Which is not to say, I mean, most people who are listening to Close Hours, I would hope all are not in that boat of being full of hate, but they may be feeling that it's really hard to live in the moment because the past seems so much better, right? And I think that's also, I think it's a normal part of getting older, whether you're getting older as in you're in your 20s now and you're no longer a teenager or you're like in your 50s and you used to be in your 40s, right? Like you still you feel that longing for what you think was a better time. Right. Well, I think we also mourn the future that we were hoping to have. Mm -hmm. You know, that yeah. for me is like, you know, I had these plans and now they're, they're just not doable. And that makes me sad. But I also want to go back to your point of, you know, when you're lying in bed and you're ruminating over what happened at work, I mean, I've done that. I did it not that mm -hmm. long ago. I'm in the shower. It's lovely, perfectly warm water, you know, shampoo my hair. And I'm going over a situation that is super petty at my <laughs> office. And I lather myself up into just being super pissed off about it. <laughs> yep. Yep. And I'm like, yeah. well, I just ruined a perfectly good mood over nothing because this is just petty BS. And yeah. that's what I find fascinating. And that's what I mean that we really do have a say in our emotions. That, that was self-inflicted. I did that. Not the situation, not the person doing the situation. I did that. And so if we can kind of get into the habit of understanding how we kind of stoke our own fires, both good and not so great, that is really helpful in kind of managing our our upset, our emotions that we don't necessarily feel comfortable in. We get to determine how long we hang out with them. You know what I mean? And it's not mm -hmm. it's not just I don't believe in ignoring things or pushing things under the rug, but at the same time, if you're just kind of picking that scab, poking that wound, well, that's an intentional act. It's not just the emotion, you know, coming over you. It's you diving into it. And like I said, I, I do it. I still do it. And I'm like, why are you doing this to yourself? Knock it off. Yeah. But yeah. that, that hate and that rage that's going on, it's constantly being stoked. And we can see it in certain aspects of social media and the media itself. It's purposely being stoked because well, somebody's making money off of it, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So if we can kind of dial back our per participation in that and kind of take ownership over what we're feeling and what we're doing and how we can do it better for ourselves. And this isn't like some sort of moral high ground. It's just, how are you feeling? How are you doing? What can you do to help you? Then that's the start. But if we're constantly looking outside of, 
who's got something more than we have or who's doing something we don't like, if we're looking at that, then we're causing our own discomfort. It's mm-hmm. not necessary. Somebody yeah. is always going to have more than you and people are always going to have less than you. Whatever you have, appreciate it because it can go away or it can, you know, blossom into something even more great. But it's, it's just understanding that we have a lot of power and we just don't always utilize it in the right ways for ourselves. Yeah, that is so, that's so true that the power really is within us. Let's take a moment to thank some of the incredible small businesses who keep Clothes Horse going via their generous Patreon support. Selena Sanders, a social impact brand that specializes in upcycle clothing using only reclaimed vintage or thrifted materials from tea towels, linens, blankets, and quilts. Sustainably crafted in Los Angeles, each piece is designed to last in one's closet for generations to come. Maximum style, minimal carbon footprint. Shift clothing out of beautiful Astoria, Oregon, with a focus on natural fibers, simple hardworking designs, and putting fat people first. Discover more at shiftwheeler.com. Late to the party, creating one-of-a-kind statement clothing from vintage, salvaged, and thrifted textiles. They hope to tap into the dreamy memories we all hold. Floral curtains, a childhood dress, the wallpaper in your best friend's rec room all while creating modern, sustainable garments that you'll love wearing and have for years to come. Late to the Party is passionate about celebrating and preserving textiles, the memories they hold, and the stories they have yet to tell. Check them out on Instagram at Late to the Party People. Vino Vintage, based just outside of LA. We love the hunt of shopping secondhand because you never know what you might find. Catch us at flea markets around Southern California by following us on Instagram at vino.vintage so you don't miss our next event. Gabriela Antonis is a visual artist, an upcycler, and a fashion designer. But Gabriela Antonis is also a feminist micro business with radical ideals. She's the one woman band trying to help you understand why slow fashion is what the world needs. If you find yourself in New Orleans, Louisiana, you may buy her ready to wear upcycle garments in person at the store Slow Down at 2855 Magazine Street. Slowdown Nola only sells vintage and slow fashion from local designers, and Gabriella's garments are guaranteed to be in stock in person, but they also have a website, so you may support this woman-owned and run business from wherever you are. If you're interested in Gabriella making a one-of-a-kind garment for you, DM her on Instagram at slowfashiongabriella to book a consultation. Please follow her on Instagram at slowfashiongabriella. That's Gabriella with one L. Dylan Page is an online clothing and lifestyle brand based out of St. Louis, Missouri. Our products are chosen with intention for the conscious community. Everything we carry is animal-friendly, ethically made, sustainably sourced, and cruelty-free. Dylan Page is for those who never stop questioning where something comes from. We know that personal experience dictates what's sustainable for you, and we are here to help guide and support you to make choices that fit your needs. Check us out at dylanpage.com and find us on Instagram at Dylan Page Life and Style. Salt Hats, purveyors of truly sustainable hats, hand blocked, sewn, and embellished in Detroit, Michigan. Find us on Instagram at Salt Hats. Gentle Vibes Vintage. We are purveyors of polyester and psychedelic relics. We encourage experimentation and play not only in your wardrobe, but in your home too. We have thousands of killer vintage pieces ready for their next adventure. See them all on Instagram at Gentle Vibes Vintage. Thumbprint is Detroit's only fair trade marketplace located in the historic Eastern Market. Our small business specializes in products handmade by empowered women in South Africa, making a living wage creating things they love like hand-painted candles and ceramics. We also carry a curated assortment of sustainable and natural locally made goods. Thumbprint is a great gift destination for both the special people in your life and for yourself. 
Browse our online store at thumbprintdetroit.com and find us on Instagram at thumbprintdetroit. High Energy Vintage is a fun and funky vintage shop located in Somerville, Massachusetts, just a few minutes away from downtown Boston. They offer a highly curated selection of bright and colorful clothing and accessories from the 1940s to the 1990s for people of all genders. Husband and wife duo Wiley and Jessamy handpick each piece for quality and style with a focus on pieces that transcend trends and will find a home in your closet for many years to come. In addition to clothing, the shop also features a large selection of vintage vinyl and old school video games. Find them on Instagram at High Energy Vintage, online at highenergyvintage.com, and at markets in and around Boston. Vagabond Vintage DTLV is a vintage clothing, accessories, and decor reselling business based in downtown Las Vegas, Nevada. Not only do we sell in Las Vegas, but we're also located throughout resale markets in San Francisco, as well as at a curated boutique called Lux and Ivy located in Indianapolis, Indiana. Jessica, the founder and owner of Vagabond Vintage DTLV, recently opened the first IRL location located in the Arts District of downtown Las Vegas on August 5th. The shop has a strong emphasis on 60s and 70s garments, single stitch tees, and dreamy loungewear. Follow them on Instagram at Vagabond Vintage DTLV and keep an eye out for their website coming fall of 2022. Thinking about the idea of this like hedonic happiness, which is just stuff, right? Right. It does raise a question, which is mm-hmm. like, it, I mean, I don't know. It's like an adage, right? Uh, money can't buy you happiness. And, you know, like... I think most people existing right now would say, well, okay, like maybe like buying s- stuff for the most part doesn't bring you happiness, but there's something to be said from being able to pay your rent and your bills right. and not worry. <laughs> right. right. But there, I think even that, like, honestly, like I get so stoked when someone posts like, you're not going to believe it, but I paid off all my credit card debt or I made my last payment on my student loans or I was able to get some of my student loans forgiven. I feel such joy for that person Oh yes. and that happiness. And I think sometimes like, yeah, there is happiness in money. It's just not in the stuff aspect per se. Right. Unless it's something like, you know, hey, I finally like bought a bike and I don't have to walk anymore and it's great. I save all this time like that. Okay. Yeah. There was happiness in that, in that purchase. But we know that the vast majority of the things we're sold every day don't really make us very happy. So that raises the question. Mm-hmm. Are billionaires happy? <laughs> well, let's see. Let's take a look <laughs> outside our window right now and just have a glance. I would say for the most part, no. Um, if we look at some of the ones that are more vocal right now, Absolutely not. Oh, and no. Again, Elon Musk is, like, incredibly unhappy. I think we can all agree. Especially right now. <laughs> yeah, seriously. <laughs> seriously. And, but when I look at those people, they are constantly going after more and more and more. And I pick on Jeff Bezos a lot because his yacht's yacht has a yacht. Mm-hmm. And um, so how much more do you need? And I wouldn't feel that way about Jeff if... All of his workers were happy and taken care of and were on the path to home ownership and retirement with good health care and all that stuff, right? If we heard those right. happy tales coming out of Amazon, I would have a different perspective on Mr. Bezos. Um, but I would say if I think Oprah's a billionaire, right? I think she has to be or she damn close. She should be. Yeah. And I think yeah. she's pretty happy. Yeah, I, I think, think so William too. Buffett has li- led a pretty happy life. Um, I don't know him personally, but you know what I mean? He's not out there snarking. So yeah. I would say, you know, the Obamas may not be billionaires, but I would think that they have a sense of happiness. So when I look at like, you know, the ultra wealthy that are chill, like uh, Mackenzie, right? Mackenzie um, Bezos. She's yeah. giving it all away. That's how you do billionaire. She's still fine. She's still sitting pretty, but she's doing something with that money. Because how much do you really, really need? And I often equate happiness with cake. 
because cake does make me happy. But it does. A cake on its own, like a really good cake, doesn't need frosting. It's delicious as is. If you just have frosting, you're going to feel sick pretty quick, get that kind of queasy headache. Mm -hmm. So the cake itself, the actual sponge, as they say on the Great British Baking Show, is eudaimonic happiness. It's delicious on its own. Hedonic happiness is the frosting. And if you put too much on, you're not going to feel very good. You're going to it's true. be a little nauseous. And if you look at a well-made layer cake, there's a good ratio of a lot of cake to a, a little bit of frosting. That's the balance you want. You don't have equal parts cake and frosting because that would just be gross. You want I to mean, really I might eat that. I'm just saying. <laughs> I'm... I do love some icing, but it does make me sick. <laughs> okay, and I don't I don't want to get sued here, but have you ever had a Sprinkles cupcake? I have, yes. Okay. I have never not had a headache after having a Sprinkles cupcake. No, same. Yeah, same. thank you. And there would it's be too a much sugar. The and, and I'm like, <sighs> exactly. I'm like, there's too much frosting. There's too much whatever's going on in this frosting that is just it's just out of whack. And yet huge, hugely popular. But there is a balance and you have to just kind of appreciate your cake and then <laughs> slather on a little bit of frosting every once in a while and enjoy it even more. Yeah. But the frosting isn't the goal. The frosting just makes you sick. It's delicious, but it makes you sick. It's true. <laughs> I do feel like we are, so many of us, we are in this, this is what modern life is, whatever that means. Mm. It's been the modern life for decades now of we work, we shop, then we work some more, then we shop mm -hmm. and we work and we shop and we shop because work sucks, but we need to work to shop, right? Mm -hmm. And there is no doubt that the fact that so many of us are so overworked and so stressed out about money and our future, there's no doubt that that is the reason we buy so much stuff or one of the big reasons. Like I definitely, I mean, I'm sure you've had the job too where it's, you're on lunch and you're just like, oh, I'm going to go look at Zara and buy something to cheer myself up. <laughs> so I have a reason to get through this day, right? Right. Like, like we prop ourselves up with that stuff and that whole notion of like treat yourself, right? Right. Is like... It's like, so you can cope with ca late stage capitalism. And so I wonder, like, do you have advice for people who are buying stuff to cheer themselves up, who are stuck in the workshop, workshop life that we live, what they could do instead of buying something? Well, just like you said before, read a book. You can get a free <laughs> one at the library. You can get a free audio book from the library, right, right. Um, spend time with friends. That doesn't always mm -hmm. have to cost something. And if it does, you know, just maybe make it a cup of coffee or a glass of wine. Um, mm -hmm. It's, I will say this, we are raised to be very good consumers. Like I said before, we are. and debt will anchor you like nothing else. Mm -hmm. So if you're, if you're able to spend money and it doesn't put you into debt, I don't know that I have an argument for you. If you're, if you're <laughs> spending money and it's putting you into debt, that's keeping you anchored to that job that you don't like, you are stuck in an awful pattern and no amount of shopping is going to get you out of that. You're only mm -hmm. putting yourself deeper and deeper and deeper into that hole. And I have been there because when you are feeling low, you want anything to lift you up. And you will find reasons and excuses and deals and sales that you can rationalize to death. But it's, it's a band-aid. Yeah. And you're not yeah. dealing with the actual issue of why am I not happy? What about this job makes me unhappy? What about my situation makes me unhappy? And what can I do to make myself happy? So my situation can start changing. Mm -hmm. And it's not, what pair of shoes has ever solved a problem? <laughs> it's, 
It's it's a true story. You know, as soon as you say shoes, I think of Carrie Bradshaw. <laughs> and I still don't know how all those shoes fit in her apartment. I mean, we know that the, the math wasn't mathing with Sex and the City, but I think so much of this one episode where she wanted to buy her apartment and mm-hmm. she couldn't because she had spent all of her money on shoes. Mm-hmm. And... While many of us are not hoarding like $500 shoes, I think many mm-hmm. of us have seen how this cycle of just trying to exist has cost us a lot of money and a lot of sort of maybe long-term security and happiness. That, oh, yes. Right? It's it's a trap. Well, when was the last time you heard the phrase disposable income? <laughs> right? Right. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> that was a buzz buzz term was, in the nineties oh. <laughs> for marketing. You know, women and single women and gay men have the highest level of disposable income. That's who we're going to focus in on, right? Yeah. Yeah. And they found a way to make that go away. And it's not really in our control. If you look at what CEOs are making versus their employees, that gap is just mathematically crazy. So there's some real stuff there that's that's not within our control. Minimum wage hasn't gone up in forever. And I remember like my uncle in the 70s could have a really crappy apartment and work a part-time job and put himself through a state university and walk away without debt, right? You could do all that. And now you can't because everything is crazy expensive. So the math is there. It's not our fault, but Amazon isn't going to solve the problem. Something showing up for you each day or each week isn't going to solve the problem. That euphoria of opening the box lasts for how long? Yeah. 30 it's seconds? so short. Yeah. 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 And, you know, you use the product a couple of times and you get a little joy and then it's collecting dust somewhere, right? And so if we, if we examine how we operate and everybody's different, it's like, okay, so I noticed this about myself. This brings me joy in the moment. And then I look at my credit card bill and then that joy is definitely gone. And then I realize how stuck I am. So how can I get out of this pattern? And the only way is to do the inside job, do the work inside and start building your form of happiness and really take advantage of what's around you, whether it's the library, whether it's friends, whether it's a walk, whether it's joining a group for a hobby that you like. There are, there are ways to fulfill yourself and your needs that aren't expensive, that aren't necessarily causing a cash flow problem. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So it's just, you know, everything you said you did when you wanted to become happier, that is just genius. And so it is doing the things that you like to do. I also love to cook. So it's not always a pleasure in my teeny tiny kitchen, but I do love to cook. <laughs> it can be danger if somebody, dangerous if somebody else is in there. Um, but if that's something that you like or you want to learn to do, do it. And yes, there's a little bit of money involved in buying food and spices and supplies and whatnot. But that's an indulgence that I will allow myself. Like I went through a phase during the pandemic where I wanted good crockery. And so when Stobe went on sale and Le Creuset went on sale, I put it on my PayPal credit where I could pay it <laughs> off in six months interest-free. And that was it. Now, like I said, I've got a teeny tiny kitchen. I can't get anything else because it's chock a block full of all the stuff I love. But mm. I put it to use. When I got my Vitamix, I got a refurbished one. Again, able to pay it off in six months, no interest. So I do understand like you want something that's going to add to your life. Absolutely go for it, but do it in a way that you are comfortable with. That isn't costing you in either the short term or the long term. And, you know, we get to enjoy our lives, but it's not always stuff that brings the joy. There's, there's other ways to do it. Maybe it's gardening for you. Maybe it's knitting. Maybe it's learning to play the ukulele. It's, it's finding what really lights you up and indulging in that much more than 
you know, and please God, I hope nobody says, but shopping really lights me up. <laughs> <laughs> you know, sometimes I think for people, the shopping is not really the stuff per se. It's the like mm -hmm. being out and about and right. maybe your friends are with you and you all go yes. out for lunch. And I found for me, like, you know, my friends and I, when I mean, the thought of like hanging out with my friends and getting to go shopping feels like such a luxury now that we are like three years into the pandemic, almost mm -hmm. four. And, you know, we we haven't seen one another in real life. And, you know, we've we've been trying to be we've been forced to try to like get back into so-called normal life. And it's been really difficult for like all of us. But when I think about the the before times when we would go shopping together, which we would do a lot, we'd go out for lunch, we'd stop and have a drink, we'd be laughing and telling jokes and having a good time. It wasn't the stuff. It was the time together. And during the right. pandemic, you know, especially in 2020 and 2021, people were like, I'm going to go buy so much stuff online, right? It, it's not the same. It's like you can place your huge Shein haul and maybe you could make a video of it. That's a way you could connect with people when it comes. But is that the same as a whole day spent together, like coming up with inside jokes? No. Right. It's it's just right. not the same. And I do feel like, you know, we have – I think people are getting burned out on, on the solo, disappointing online shopping. That's what I want to believe, that people are realizing that the real joy of shopping is not the stuff. It's the it's just being out in the world with other people, you know? Uh, yes. Which brings me to my next question, which is, mm -hmm. you know, listen, as 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 you've mentioned, shit is going down right now. It is dark. <laughs> it is yes. dark. This timeline is very dark, right? I think, as we mentioned early in our conversation, there is this thought that we should, when things are bad, whether it is climate change, whether it is genocide, whether it is war – uh, that we should not have any joy or happiness in our lives while those things are happening, even if they're not directly happening to us. I mean, climate change is happening to all of us, but you know what I mean. Right. Like there is this expectation that we should we should live a life of joyless austerity and, you know, maybe despair also. Um, and if we don't, then we're bad people. So can you explain to me how can you find happiness in a scary world? And and not feel ashamed of happiness. If we don't have happiness, then all we have is anger, grief, and sorrow, and rage. Mm -hmm. How's that working for us so far? How's that working for the world so far? Yeah. Okay. So it's not that being happy takes away from the understanding of what's going on in this world right now. It's saying that for me to operate as a human in a healthy manner, I need that, that well-toned interior of understanding happiness and joy so I can cope, so I can go out there and be helpful to other people, so I can make decisions based on logic rather than anger. Mm -hmm. And so it's not just, you know, dancing through the daisies, like I said before. It's not that. It's just understanding that we are here for a very finite period of time. And we need to do our best. And to do our best, we need to be our our happiest, I believe. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that is all within context. You know, if you looked at my life, it is so far from perfect. It is <laughs> not at all how I saw it, you know, happening. And all of that's okay. And yes, I have times where I mourn what I thought was going to happen that I was so sure was going to be. But uh, so what? You know, and, and that's a very flip phrase, but really, so what? We can, we can put a lot of meaning on a lot of things, but we have to keep perspective of what to be really upset about. And I will share with you that I am talking to you from my teeny tiny 225 square foot duplex that I thought maybe I'd live in for a year, possibly two. 
Mm -hmm. This month makes it 11 years. Oh, wow. Well, that's great because yeah. you know what? You don't have to move and moving sucks as a person who just did it. <laughs> moving does so, suck. But there you go. It's so, <laughs> it's so ridiculously cheap for the area that I live. Utilities mm -hmm. are included. And yes, I oh, wow. stub my toes an awful lot. But it's, I'm oddly in no rush to move. Right. Now, you would think <laughs> to be really happy i need a bigger space. And I do want a bigger space. I miss having house guests. I miss having dinner parties. I miss that. But this has given me a level of happiness and freedom that a bigger space just couldn't provide. So it's, it's a compromise that I made that really isn't a compromise. Mm -hmm. If, mm -hmm. you know, I'm building my coaching business, but I'm also a worker bee right now. And I go in eight to five every day, right up in the elevator. I work with lovely people. I'm so, so grateful for that because I've been in jobs where it wasn't lovely. And so is it perfect? No. Is it a dream job for me? No. And that is just fine. Everything doesn't have to be so heightened. Everything doesn't have to be Instagrammable, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We just have to understand what our priorities are and what's going to foster that happiness right now in this world as we have to exist in it. And I'm a novid. I wear my mask everywhere. Sometimes I'm shot a look, <laughs> but <laughs> I also go out to dinner. Like I take myself out to dinner. I'll meet with friends. Last night I had dinner, took myself out because it was Thursday. So that was my treat. I'm like, it's been kind of a long week. We're just going to go and have some vegan moussaka, really great Greek place by me. And it was just lovely. Now, there were several big parties, so I did get a little paranoid towards the end. I'm like, okay, it was much more crowded on a rainy night than I thought it would be. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's a chance for me to sit down, have a good dinner, and write, and that brings me joy. Did I spend a little bit of money? Yeah. But it was just being around that energy of happy people, people celebrating birthdays and anniversaries and whatnot there. So it's, it's having an understanding of who we are, mm -hmm. our circumstances, and what we're dealing with, and still giving ourselves permission to be happy, no shame, doing what we need to do to be our best selves. And that ripples forward. So all of our happiness, it's contagious, right? If you're around a really happy person, how do you feel when you're with them? And on the flip side, if you're with somebody in a really crap mood and you're in a good one, how do you feel when you're around them? Yeah. Terrible. <laughs> well, they can. It really can. It's like, okay, we're going to have a little bit of a war here. Whose mood's going to win? It's usually the crap mood because- It always you know, is. <laughs> it just sucks the oxygen right out of the room. It really does. But I have to ask, you know, let's all picture it together. Who do we think is stronger, a happy person or an angry person? I mean, probably the happy person, right? Which is ironic because... Right, but, yeah. but most people would say, oh, well, the angry person. Interesting. Because, well, at least when I've asked it, I will say most people, I'm very reductive. But it's... <laughs> We lean towards the anger because we see that as powerful, as mm -hmm. productive. And we see happy people as just, you know, standing there smiling, you know, while the world around them is burning. And that's just not the case. I think if you are able to be happy in your worst circumstances, you have an inner strength that is admirable. And there is absolutely no shame in that. And that is something worth giving to yourself because it goes out to the world. So there is no reason not to be happy in this horrible, horrible time because I think happiness is the antidote. I really do. And it's a wackadoodle theory, but clearly in the last seven, now eight years, the perpetual anger and upset hasn't helped. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It hasn't. It hasn't. But it's interesting. It's like 
you know, I'm going to tell you that, you know, what's happening in Gaza now is really hard to reconcile with day-to-day life. It is very challenging to get up every day and say, mm-hmm. like, I'm going to live my life today. And unfortunately, we're never allowed to get off the treadmill of of capitalism to just mm-hmm. sit sit within our grief. Like, we have to work, right? Uh we have to pay rent. Like I don't get to skip paying rent this month because the world is unjust, right? Mm-hmm. And I will tell you, like I have seen so much across social media. And my husband has reminded me that often the most unhappy people are the loudest people on social media, which I think is fair. Um, so many people out there saying like, well, I see all of you out there like getting married or going on trips or celebrating your children's birthdays. And I just can't believe what selfish monsters you are. Right. Or I remember someone who I respect deeply posted back in December that they were basically shaming anyone who was celebrating Christmas because how could they do that during all that suffering and that they were going to go to holiday parties because they had to, but they would just be pretending to have a good time. And I, I, I see people posting like I literally am – I was up crying all night over this and I am now crying all day. And I just – I want to reach out to these people and just like take their hand and be like mm-hmm. it's it's going to be okay. But I think, you know, there's not going to be a simple solution where things get fixed really fast and we get to return to living our lives oblivious. Like we have to unfortunately find – find a way to be both happy and and sad and angry you know and and i think maybe that is because we have been taught that the way that we're happy is is these like huge unreachable things mm-hmm. maybe that's why it's hard for us to see that we could be both happy and grieving I, I don't know. I don't do you, no. do you encounter people who are like i literally just cannot get happy right now because of the world and I can totally understand that. And to see that people aren't stopping in their tracks and paying attention, I get it. It feels like it's being disregarded. I also think that we are in a period of such huge overwhelm. I don't even know how to describe it, but what we've been through from 2016 on between, you know, seeing that we have Nazis here on our soil, that we have a pandemic that was just kind of, you know, initially glossed over and all of that Mm -hmm. loss. We have first responders and doctors and nurses and hospital workers that have never gotten a break. Mm -hmm. And everything just keeps happening. We were watching... George Floyd be murdered. We're seeing other people murdered just for jogging or being in their bed and somebody else got the wrong address. There's a lot that has happened to a lot of people and a lot of communities are affected. So if you're just witnessing any of this, there's a level of overwhelm that I don't think that we're recognizing and we're still trying to process the first bit of trauma, let alone the most recent trauma. Right. So there's a lot that we have to process and it may come out as silence and an apparent non-reaction because we're processing it. Like, how is this happening after everything else is happening? Why is it we can't stop this? Mm -hmm. How is it that this hasn't changed yet? So I understand how people feel that way. I remember the first time I lost a friend, it was the spring break after high school, and he died in a car accident. And I got into the car the next day, and and the radio came on, and they were just playing music like nothing had happened, Mm -hmm. you know? And this beautiful soul was taken from us and people were just going on about their lives. And, you know, I'm, I think maybe I was just about to turn 19 and I was just staggered. Like, how can anything go on? Like it's normal. 
don't they understand that this person is no longer here? But the perspective of the world, it's, it's, that's not even seen. It's just my community that was affected. You know what I mean? And so I understand the devastation. I understand. And, and again, like I said, I'm very reductive. I'm not comparing this to anything. It's just everybody's perspective on a situation is a little different. And all we can do is kind of educate and share what we're going through. I have friends that are literally scared to death right now and are so angry and so devastated and feeling all the things. And Mm -hmm. all I can do is be present with them and be an ear and a shoulder and an arm. And it, and it feels kind of useless. Like, am I really helping? What else can I do? And that's sort of our human experience. What can we do? Well, we can pick up the phone. We can call a representation and say, this is what I would like to have happen. Mm-hmm. We can mm-hmm. go out and vote. We can go out and protest. We can decide I'm not going to do business with this person or I am going to do business with that person. There are certain things that are within our control and there are certain things that aren't. I believe in, in bearing witness to things and, and having an understanding and when appropriate, asking questions. But life does go on. Yeah. And people are going to get married and babies are going to be born. And how do we not celebrate that? Right. Right. And life goes on. (laughs) It does. And that sounds harsh. It does sound harsh, but it's real. It's real. You know, what, what is the choice? Just like you said, what is the choice? What is the answer? What is the solution? We've been doing this a long time. We haven't seemed to come up with one. (laughs) <laughs> like this is the appropriate way to behave. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, the pandemic itself is a great example of that, right? Like yeah. it was kind of like, well, y'all need to keep working and living as if it's normal life when it is 100% not. Right. You know, that was an extreme version, but and it we're is- still debating it. We're Yeah, we are. We are still <laughs> debating it. Like how could it have been better? I mean, I have, I have thoughts. We all have thoughts, right? Yes. Yeah. I have lots of thoughts. <laughs> I still have them. Like the, mm-hmm. I still, yeah. Um, but yeah, no. I mean, you're right. Like, I, you know, like something that that honestly becomes more and more apparent as you get older uh, is is the fleeting nature of life, mm-hmm. and it's not selfish. And you can tell me if it's selfish. I won't hurt my feelings. It's it's in my opinion, it's not selfish to be happy while you're living that life. It's not. How can anyone tell you not to be happy? We're all learning and growing all the time. And I think that we are learning and growing as a society, you know, to be, to be better humans, right? To be better to one another, to be better to the world around us. And I think that right now we, we are learning a lot about especially i would say people who are younger because you know like we dealt with mm-hmm. 911 right we've been dealing with genocide and atrocities around the world our entire lives if you watch the news you can in fact understand what ethan hawk would say like if you're happy you just don't know what's going on around you you know like yeah you're not paying attention <laughs> yeah you're not paying attention right um i i, I can i can see that and I think that many of us who are older have learned that like, hey, uh, planes can fly into the Twin Towers and people can die and it can be a, an extraordinarily like nationally mm-hmm. traumatic experience. And yet people are still going to get married that week or ha- babies are going to be born that week. We have to be respectful and aware and present. Every day there's a tragedy. And... Every day there's something wonderful too. So how do we how do we balance that? But you cannot judge another person for carrying on because at the end of the day, you don't know what they've been through. You don't know the traumas they've they've already dealt with and survived and have worked with. So the assumption 
that somebody looks like they're happy and burden free can be very, very wrong. It's not, not feeling other things when you're happy. I am happy and I am pissed off. I am happy and I am sad. I am happy and I'm frustrated. And that's yeah. me all day long. So it's, it's not yeah. just one yeah. thing. That's toxic positivity. That is bullshit. And that's the difference. Right. So anybody that's good vibes only, you're doing yourself a major disservice. Anybody who doesn't want to feel anything negative, you're doing yourself a huge disservice. But anybody that tells you you shouldn't feel positive about something is also doing a huge disservice. <sighs> so, okay, you know, when you meet with someone to coach them on their happiness, like, what do you do? How does it start? Well, it starts with willingness. It starts with giving yourself permission to be happy. And that's the first thing. And it must sound really silly, but you have to not only want it, but allow yourself to have it. And if there's any sort of pushback mm -hmm. to that, it's going to be a harder work. You have to really kind of surrender to wanting to be happy. And that, that can be a challenge, especially if I know anger was my bestie for a long time. It really made me feel protected. I was really good at it. And, mm -hmm. you know, so it's understanding that we have to kind of let down some of our armor and we have to kind of bring down our walls and really start to open up. And it's a great thing. And that doesn't make you weak and it doesn't make you, you know, a doormat. It doesn't make you a mark. It's, it's a different kind of armor. It's really pretty, <laughs> but it's, yeah. Yeah. so to start, that's, that's where we begin. Are you ready? Are you willing to commit to it? And it's not really a long process. Like I know some coaches like, let's, let's look at this signing up for a year kind of crap. No, it's six weeks. Right. Yeah. Right. We work together okay. for six weeks and hopefully in that time you see a change. And then I want you to go out there and kind of live it and see what sticks and see what you might need help with. Mm -hmm. And maybe you don't need any help with it. You've just got it. I'm good. But if, if after a bit of time that you want to do some more work, then we get together again. But to me, anytime you're trying to make any sort of change, it, you can't always be in a learning cycle. You have to kind of take in the information and then go out and apply it and continue your learning from there. So it's, it's basically we, we chat for an hour once a week for six weeks and kind of just go over really feeding into that eudaimonic happiness and understanding how to still achieve the hedonic, but really just building up that happy muscle within you and finding that resilience and finding that joy and just really starting to appreciate and like your life. And again, it doesn't have to be perfect. All of that good stuff will come, mm -hmm. but it's, it's just really appreciating what you have right now as it is. It's transformative in really, really lovely ways. I mean, I think this is really important work. You know, I do. <laughs> I mean, it's like life changing for it people. Is, it was for me. And I mean, it's, it's totally goofy. Like a happiness coach is totally. I know it sounds so silly, but then when you talk about it, you're like, oh my God, like so many of us need that yeah, help. It's just a little guidance. We need to learn. Yeah. Because yeah. it is really our natural it's, it's, state. Babies, aside from colic, don't come out of the womb grumpy, right? Like if you right. have a colicky baby, yeah. that's, that's, you know, unfortunate and all that. For the most part, they're kind of thrilled to be here. Yeah. I don't know. I will say when my daughter was born, she did seem really pissed off for like a day or two, but. <laughs> well, you get a slap on the backside. Yeah. <laughs> and that's how we were birthed in my generation. You came out, they whacked you on the ass and that's how and you're that's introduced how to life. Life began. <laughs> But yeah, no, you're so, right. Yeah, we come and scream. You're right, though. Like in general, you know? 
in general. Yeah. I mean, birth is painful. Rebirth is painful. Mm-hmm. I'm not going to gloss it over. But when we look at ourselves as children, innately, excluding certain circumstances, because again, I'm reductive, <laughs> innately, we want to be happy. Yeah. We want to have joy. We want to have fun. We want to share that joy. You know, we're playing, we're sharing our toys with our friends, yeah. right? We're bringing people into our circle saying, hey, come join us on, you know, we're all going on the slide or whatever it is. That's how we start. How did that end? So it's just kind of relearning that a little bit that yes, we're meant to be happy. Despite everything, we are meant to be happy. But that doesn't mean we aren't other things too. Yeah, I totally agree. Well, I want to thank you so much for sharing some, what I think is really important advice with everybody who's listening to this. And I think like, once again, probably for a lot of listeners, it's like, wait, why aren't we talking about clothes today? Well, guess what? We've been talking about clothes this whole time. (laughs) You just didn't see it. (laughs) Because what we're really talking about is how Sometimes or often we, what we think is going to make us happy is not the actual thing that's going to make us happy. And we just aren't seeing what's really going to make us happy. I totally agree. And as somebody who went to the whole uniform capsule wardrobe situation, Mm -hmm. oh my God, that makes me so happy. There you go. Simplicity, saving time. Never having to think about what you're going to wear because you can wear everything. (laughs) <laughs> is is bliss. So just to bring it back to the clothes, <laughs> there is a way for them to bring you joy. Absolutely. But, um, but yeah, no, I really appreciate you having me on. I think you have an amazing podcast and I love what you talk about and what you're teaching people. So thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you. If you're enjoying this episode, then this is a great time to remind you that my work here at Close Horse is made possible by the support of listeners like you, just like NPR, and these great small businesses. Please go give them your support. Blank Cass, or Blanket Coats by Cass, is focused on restoring, renewing, and reviving the history held within vintage and heirloom textiles by embodying the love, craft, and energy that is original to each vintage textile as I transfer it into a new garment, I hope we can reteach ourselves to care for and mend what we have and make it last. Blank Cass lives on Instagram at blank underscore Cass and a website will be launched soon at blankcass.com. Located in Whistler, Canada, Velvet Underground is a velvet jungle full of vintage and secondhand clothing, plants, a vegan cafe, and lots of rad products from other small sustainable businesses. Our mission is to create a brand and community dedicated to promoting self-expression, as well as educating and inspiring a more sustainable and conscious lifestyle, both for the people and the planet. Find us on Instagram at shop underscore velvet underground or online at www.shopvelvetunderground.com. St. Evans is a New York City based vintage shop that is dedicated to bringing you those special pieces you'll reach for again and again. More than just a store, St. Evans is dedicated to sharing the stories and history behind the garments. 10% of all sales are donated to a different charitable organization each month. New Vintage is released every Thursday at wearstevens.com with previews of new pieces and more brought to you on Instagram at where underscore st dot evens. That's where St. Evans. Country Feedback is a mom and pop record shop in Tarboro, North Carolina. They specialize in used rock, country, and soul and offer affordable vintage clothing and housewares. Do you have used records you want to sell? Country Feedback wants to buy them. Find us on Instagram at Country Feedback Vintage and Vinyl or head down east and visit our brick and mortar. All are welcome at this inclusive and family-friendly record shop in the country. Republica Unicornia Yarns. Handmade yarn and notions for the color obsessed. Made with love and some swearing in fabulous Atlanta, Georgia by head yarn wench Kathleen. 
Get ready for rainbows with a side of giving a damn. Republica Unicornia is all about making your own magic using small batch, responsibly sourced, hand-dyed yarns, and thoughtfully made notions. Slow fashion all the way down and discover the joy of creating your very own beautiful hand-knit, crocheted, or woven pieces. Find us on Instagram at Republica underscore Unicornia underscore yarns and at www.republicaunicornia.com. Picnic Wear, a slow fashion brand ethically made by hand from vintage and dead stock materials, most notably vintage towels. Founder Danny has worked in the industry as a fashion designer for over 10 years, but started Picnic Wear in response to her dissatisfaction with the industry's shortcomings. Picnic Wear recently moved to rural North Carolina, where all their sewing and accessories are now designed and cut, but the majority of their sewing is done by skilled garment workers in New York City. Their customers take comfort in knowing that all their sewists are paid well above New York City minimum wage. Picnic Wear offers minimal waste and maximum authenticity. Future vintage over future garbage. Cute Little Ruin is an online shop dedicated to providing quality vintage and secondhand clothing, vinyl, and home items in a wide range of styles and price points. If it's ethical and legal, we try to find a home for it. Vintage style with progressive values. Find us on Instagram at Cute Little Ruin. Is there a little bit of Italy in your soul? Are you an enthusiast of pre-loved decor and accessories? Bring vintage Italian style and history into your space with the pewter thimble. We source useful and beautiful things and mend them where needed. We also find gorgeous illustrations and make them print worthy. Tarot cards, tea towels, and hand-picked treasures available to you from the comfort of your own home. Responsibly sourced from across Rome, lovingly renewed by fairly paid artists and artisans, with something for every budget. Discover more at thepewterthimble.com. Deco Denim is a startup based out of San Francisco, and it sells clothing and accessories that are sustainable, gender fluid, size inclusive, and high quality, made to last for years to come. Deco Denim is trying to change the way you think about buying clothes. Founder Sarah Mattis wants to empower people to ask important questions like, where was this made? Was this garment made ethically? Is this fabric made of plastic? Can this garment be upcycled? And if not, can it be recycled? Sign up at decodenim.com to receive $20 off your first purchase. They promise not to spam you and send out no more than three emails a month, with two of them surrounding education or a personal note from the founder. Again, that's decodenim.com. Thanks so much to Sandra for spending some time with me. I really enjoyed our conversation so much. I've been thinking about it nonstop over the last few weeks. So thank you. Thank you, Sandra, for sharing your expertise and your ideas and really inspiring me to look within my own life and make some changes. There are many places that you can find Sandra and benefit from her thoughtful expertise. You can find her on Instagram and Threads as the happiest official. You can find her on both of those platforms as well as Sassy Little Pod, and you can also find out more about her Substack. And you can visit her website, thehappiest.me. And don't worry, I'm going to share all of that in the show notes. One last thing before I end this episode, because it's a long boy again. Don't forget about our first ever Clothes Horrors webinar hangout sesh happening on February 29th, aka Leap Day. It's free. It's hosted virtually via Zoom. We'll be talking about why clothes are kind of garbage right now, and I'll be taking questions. There are about 30 spots left as I record this, so don't snooze on signing up. Thanks for listening to another episode of Clothes Horse, written, researched, edited, all the things by me, Amanda Lee McCarty. You know what I'm going to say. You like what you're hearing? Leave a rating, leave a review, subscribe, but most importantly, tell your friends. Maybe tell them IRL. (laughs) If you'd like to support my work financially, there are so many ways. You can find them in my Instagram profile, in the show notes, or at my website, clotheshorsepodcast.com. 
And last but never least, of course, thanks to Dustin Travis White for our music and audio support. Bye. 